Here we go. Yeah, so this is just going to be a very brief uh, introduction to Revelation. Um, the book of Revelation, that is, it's often in, in some Bibles, it's often titled the Revelation of St. John, St. John the Divine, I think. But really, the book of Revelation is, uh, as it says in the, in the first verse, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, so it's, it was John who wrote down the words. Um, but the revelation is from from Jesus Christ. And the word revelation in the Greek is this word uh, ap apocalypsis, apocalypsis, uh, from which we get the words, uh, you know, apocalypse, apocalyptic. Uh, and in the in the Greek, that word means an uncovering, an uncovering. So something which is, as we get the word revelation, something which is revealed. Uh, so this this book, it's uh, a book that's often misunderstood. It's a, a book that's often uh, misinterpreted. It's um, you know quite a different book from from uh, certainly any other book in the in the New Testament. Um, it's much more similar to uh, many of the the books of prophecy from the Old Testament, um, which prophesied sort of times to come. And uh, as we see here in the in the first verse of Revelation, it describes it quite clearly. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So uh, the Lord, our uh, uh, Father, gave this revelation to Jesus Christ. For what purpose? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So there's a bit of a passing along of this uh, revelation of this message. God the Father uh, gave this revelation to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ sent it by his angel to his servant, John, John the Apostle. Uh, and John wrote it down that we, his servants, might receive it uh, to understand these things that which must shortly come to pass, uh, as it says. And uh, it, it describes, as it says here, things which must shortly come to pass. Things, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go on and explain this uh, in a, bit, a bit more. This will be, as I say, a very brief introduction. Uh, it's maybe a bit of a, a series of conversations about Revelation because it's, uh, it's a jam-packed <laughs> book, let me say, of, uh, of many things of, of wisdom. So just really, just going to look at the first, uh, some uh, of the verses in the first chapter of Revelation is one I'm going to look at today, um, but also uh, how Revelation is often misunderstood. So uh, going down to, uh, to verse 3, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So it's an encouragement uh, that this book is one that is meant to be uh, read. It is meant to be uh, heard. It's meant to be taken in. It's meant to be. be ready because the, the the time to the end uh, are here uh, jesus christ can return any moment you know like a thief in the night we're told uh, so we we always need to be watchful we always need to be on our on our guard so there's i mentioned many different ways that the book of revelation has been understood historically and is understood now just to just to look at a couple of those so these are the four main ways in which Revelation is understood. Uh, Preterism, which means the past. Historicism, uh, which uh, understands Revelation as stuff that's happening in the present. Futurism, it's all in the future. And idealism, uh, it's, it's not meant to refer to any specific events. So I'll just talk about each of those in, in turn in a bit more detail. So uh, the preterist understanding, uh, understanding of past events uh, is when people believe that everything that's mentioned in the entirety of the book of Revelation, it's all been fulfilled, it all happened, uh, 
uh, back in you know the first century. So it all happened around the time when John was writing, or or straight after. It was only meant for then. That that's that's an understanding. Uh, so they believe all it's talking about is the um, the early struggles of the, the Christian Church, the fall of Jerusalem, um, and the rise of the Roman Empire at that time. They believe that's all it's referring to, and and nothing more after that. Uh, so um, historicism. Uh, so that is un an understanding that Revelation is talking about a series of events that happened <coughs> over. A period of time since John started writing right up until now and uh, what is talked about in the in the future and that's the understanding that that we have that there are things in Revelation which have already been fulfilled there are things in Revelation which are being fulfilled right now and there are some things which will be fulfilled in the in the times to come um, and actually most throughout most of the the history of the church that has been the understanding of, of of uh, revelation that it, it's talked about some things which have happened some things which are happening and things which will happen in time to come so it's it's always there's always something applicable in it no matter what age uh you know christians were uh, were living in uh futurism i'll talk about in, in a bit more detail how that how that came about um that's a fairly recent understanding of, of revelation but that uh, understanding is that Pretty much none of Revelation has happened already. It's all just talking about stuff that's going to happen in the time uh, at the end, in the in the future. Um, you know, the rise of the Antichrist, the Great tri Tribulation, the Second Coming uh, of Christ. But all of that is way off, way off in the in the future. None of it's talking about you know stuff that's happening now or, or historical events. Um, and then the idealist understanding of Revelation is. Uh, the understanding that uh, none of it's talking about real events. It's all just symbolic. We don't need to worry about trying to understand, you know, what world events it's talking about. It's all just uh, it's all just types and examples and none of it. None of it refers to real, real events. Um, I can't find many people, uh, to be honest, who, who actually believe that. Uh, I've, I've looked around at various Christian churches and, you know, most uh, most people who call themselves Christian do understand that Revelation it, it, it has a, a real literal purpose to um, to tell us about real world events. So, as mentioned, historicism, which is you know what, what we understand uh, Revelation to uh, to be talking about, but it, it is applicable to our time now. Some of it's happened, some of it's still to come. For more than a thousand years, uh, that was really the only way that Revelation was understood. And uh, why that started to change. Uh, so there was a few uh, people who, second, playing around with me here. Yeah. So there was a few people who started to uh, to change that understanding. Yeah, there we go. So uh, one of the first people was uh, this chap, Arnold Arnold of Reims, which I think is a place in Italy. I think he was a uh, uh, an Italian uh, monk, and he was one of the first people who started to see in the corruption of the Catholic Church, which was really the, the sort of only game in town when it came to uh, Christianity, he saw in the corruption of the Catholic Church how it could be linked to what was spoken about in the book of Revelation. So it, it, the quote from him, Verily, if he be void of charity, love and be blown up and advanced only with knowledge and he is antichrist sitting in the temple of god and showing out himself as if he were god and he was talking about the pope when he when he uh he said that and the the papacy the catholic church uh it, there was always a measure of corruption in it but particularly around this time um and for centuries afterwards to be to be honest the corruption was very uh, open and very overblown but the thing was the church uh, had complete and total power uh, on this earth so you know it's not like nowadays where if a, if a politician does or says something wrong you know it can be all over the news and all over the social media and you find out about it they had control over all the sources of, of news, uh, all of the sources of information. Um, so they were able to, to sort of control the narrative, as it were. But 
it was so open, this corruption, that people could start to see that the Catholic Church was was not good. And remember, they didn't have the Bible to compare it to because the church wouldn't let them read the Bible. Um, but they could see, even by their own uh, wisdom and understanding, that this, this church was wrong. Uh, and we go 500 years later, at the time of the, the Reformation, there were many people in between who also linked uh, the Catholic Church and the papacy with the Antichrist. But Martin Luther was certainly the most um, high profile, <laughs> let's say that. Uh, and around the time of Martin Luther, the printing press was invented. So rather than getting a message out, having to hand write it down every time, you know, uh, different leaflets and tracts could be published and, and distributed. So uh, all of a sudden, information and news could spread far, far quicker. So when Martin Luther stood up and said, the Pope <laughs> is the very Antichrist who has exalted himself above and opposed himself against Christ, because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, which is neither ordained nor commanded by God. Uh, so when he stood up and, uh, and said that, um, all of a sudden, the world started to know and the world started to understand. And when they were able to, to hear and read uh, the book of Revelation, they suddenly started to see it in a very, very different light uh, because everything they saw in Revelation relating to the Antichrist uh, it matched up exactly with what the, the Pope and the papacy was doing at that, at that time. And, uh, of course, this had wide-reaching uh, effects. You know, um, in, in England, we broke away from the, from the, um, from the Pope. And uh, in many other countries, there was, uh, a, a, I guess, mass um, revolts against the control of the Catholic Church. Of course, this was very worrying to the, the men in power, uh, and they wanted a way to be able to fight back they didn't want to be able to to look in the in the scriptures of the own bible that they held and see themselves reflected back in these uh, negative words of, uh, of of antichrist and so uh, that's when we come to uh, a man like francisco rivera uh, who was also a um, a uh, a monk uh, a catholic monk but a loyal catholic monk loyal to the pope uh, so he tried to defend the Catholic Church and to deflect uh, away from it by coming up with this new way of understanding the, uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, and his uh, understanding was this uh, futurist understanding. So saying that uh, chapter one, uh, it was, was what John had seen. Chapters two and three of, of Revelation, okay, you know, those ones that were talking to the seven churches, they, they were, were talking to those churches at the time. But everything else, everything else, that was in the far off future. So don't worry about this Antichrist. Don't worry about the whore of Babylon. Don't worry about uh, all of these um, things that, that Revelation says will, will happen. Don't try and link them to things that are happening in the world now. Or don't try and link them to the church or the Pope or anything like that. Don't worry about that. That's all in the far off future. Um, and for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, no one apart from the Catholics really believed that, uh, to be honest. So everyone uh, who was against the Catholic Church, all of the Protestants, uh, you know, um, all of the, uh, the churches which, which rose uh, out of there or broke away from the Catholic system, none of them believed this, this futurist interpretation because they saw how clear it was uh, that the Antichrist was referring to, uh, to Rome. And it's actually only in really the past hundred years, since uh, the 1900s, that somehow this understanding of revelation has become pre predominantly popular. And one of the main reasons is uh, <laughs> the American version of Christianity, this evangelical um, Christianity that's promoted by many American churches, particularly Pentecostal churches, uh, they have adopted this idea of the futuristic understanding of, of Revelation, that the Antichrist will be some political figure that might rise up. Uh, and, and that is the understanding that they promote. They promote it in uh, their sermons. They promote it in books and TV shows and movies. The idea of this Antichrist is, is, is not yet come. It's going to be this special person that you have to watch out for that's got this power. Um, and it's been shockingly successful unfortunately this this hollywood understanding of the antichrist and of, uh, of revelation um but it's it's only been in the past sort of 
400 years that, that, that the Catholic Church has come up with this and way of understanding revelation purely, purely to defect different from the fact that they are uh, clearly linked to the, to the Antichrist. Um, so yes, that's uh, just a bit of a bit of a side note to uh, to understand why we know that revelation is talking to us here now. It's not things that are far off, it's things that we need to understand now. Uh, just going on to uh, the fourth, the, uh, the first chapter, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And so put a little uh, map there and showing where the seven churches in Asia were uh, that were that were written to. So what they called Asia then was just a, a province of the Roman Empire. Uh, all of those churches are in what we would now call Turkey, but the people, the, the Turkish people who are now there, uh, were not there at that time. It was made up of a, quite a mixture of, of different people and different cultures, Romans and Greeks and Scythians and uh, all of these different cultures sort of came together. Uh, but they were real, they were real places, they were real churches, they were all, you know, within uh, sort of a, you know, a week or two's travel from, from each other. Um, and when, uh, I, I won't talk about it today, because it, there's a lot of detail in it, but when we look at the second and third chapters of Revelation that are talking to these churches, there's really a threefold message in uh, what it is said there. So they were messages for those actual physical churches at that time. They were warnings or encouragements to those physical churches. They also contain a lot of uh, general messages for all of us Christians to, to be mindful of at all times. Um, but they also prophesy the progression of the, the church over the last 2000 years. So they talk about different church ages um, and I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in, uh, in, a, in a future uh, presentation. You also see on the map there, uh, there's a, a little mark of Patmos, um, which is the island where John was when he, when he wrote this, when he saw this vision. Uh, the sort of the legend goes, uh, it's not in the Bible, so we can't say it's true, but John was the only, um, the only apostle who basically survived to old age. All of the others were, were, were killed in various horrible ways. And the legend goes that they, they tried to kill John. They actually uh, tried to throw him in a, uh, a vat of boiling oil um, and he came out unharmed. <laughs> and so they sort of didn't really know what to do with him then. <laughs> so they, they just uh, exiled him onto this, uh, this island of, of Patmos just to get rid of him, get him out of the way. We can't seem to kill him. Let's just get him out of the way. Uh, I don't, I, you know, I can't say whether that's true or not because it's not in the Bible, but, you know, it's certainly something we know that God could do. And we know that John um, John was preserved for a purpose. And uh, and this certainly was part of the purpose he was preserved for, to deliver us this, uh, this message, this revelation of, of Jesus Christ. And um, it goes on, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And I've just highlighted that because this is one of the, to me, it's, it's just a beautiful, simple description of Jesus Christ. You know, him which is, he is, he is present, he is with us now. He's, we're told that two or three gather together, you know, the Lord is there in the midst, he's with us now. And which was, you know, when he was in, in the flesh on this earth, uh, he, he was with mankind, uh, and which is to come. And we, we're given that wonderful and precious promise of, uh, of the Lord's return to this earth in, in like manner as he went away. So, uh, I just I just personally love that that description of Jesus Christ. You know, it talks about him in this these eternal terms, yesterday, today, and forever. And then it says, uh, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And that's a little bit of one of those sort of mysterious parts of a uh, verse. Um, because you know we know there's only there's only one Holy Spirit. This isn't certainly uh, contradicting that. Um, there is a, a scripture um, which I found that might be uh, sort of in reference to uh, to this. Um, so in Isaiah 11, chapter 2, um, it talks about the Spirit and it, it mentions these seven different qualities of the Spirit. It says, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So that's that's the Holy Spirit that we uh, that we receive. It's the Spirit of the Lord, wisdom, 
understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear, and all, all, all of those things, not, not just fear, sorry, fear of the Lord, specifically. Um, it specifically says we've not received the spirit of fear. Um, so these are all of, all of the things that we can receive and we can benefit from when we, when we receive the Holy Ghost. And uh, it goes on uh, in the, in the um, preceding verses of Revelation 1, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Uh, first begotten of the dead, you know, he was raised from the dead by his father, uh, by the same spirit which will raise us from the dead on that day when the Lord returns. And when it says the prince of the kings of the earth, we often, we often think of a prince as being lower than a, lower than a king. Um, but that word prince, it really means the ruler, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Everyone on this earth, no matter their power, whatever sway they hold on this earth, they are subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he, is, he is their king. And it goes on, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Uh, it's such a, uh, a strong and powerful um, visual image, you know, of being washed physically washed in the blood of Christ. Uh, and that is what made us clean and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. And the kings and the priests in the, uh, under the old covenant, they were um, set apart for a, for a very special purpose. Uh, and the Lord is telling us here, we have been set apart for the same purpose. We have been given the authority and we've been given the commission to uh, to go out there as servants of our Lord uh, and to be able to minister to people, to be able to instruct people uh, and to, to be able to guide people towards that straight and narrow path uh, that God would have them to walk. And it finishes off, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, uh, you know, we do give praise and glory to God. We, we exalt him. We, we lift him up. We raise his name higher than any other name on this earth. And uh, his dominion, his, um, his sphere of influence, his, uh, his power is upon the whole earth. And, you know, when you understand that, that can be quite a comfort because there's a lot of things that can happen to you in this life and on this, uh, on this earth. You know, we don't know what tomorrow may bring. We don't know what this life may throw at us. Um, but none of it is outside of the influence and the power of the Lord, you know, his hand is upon all of that. So whatever the situation, we can just have full confidence in, uh, in him, uh, in his word, in his promises, and in the, the power of his spirit and his, uh, his might. Uh, amen. So um, I'll just leave those, uh, those things there. It's a brief, brief introduction today. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll maybe look uh, at 